Hello, my name is John Wilding. I'm a professor of medicine at the University of Liverpool and a clinical diabetologist. I'm here today with uh, Dr. Philip Burgess, who's a lecturer in ophthalmology also at the University of Liverpool. And we're going to talk about various aspects of diabetes and retinopathy. As you know, diabetes is still considered one of the commonest causes of blindness. And yet we've been screening for retinopathy, certainly in the UK now, for what, about 20 years. So can you tell me whether we've actually had any effect on the, on the incidence of blindness in people with diabetes since we've been systematically screening for retinopathy? Absolutely. So um, probably the most striking statistic I can give you is that in virtually every industrialised country in the world, diabetic retinopathy is the leading cause of blindness in working age people. And that's no longer the case in the UK. And that's been achieved for two reasons. One, uh, improved medical care for better control of systemic disease. But the second is a systematic screening programme in which people who are living with diabetes are offered um, photographic screening every year. So we now have a rate of uh, blindness that the diabetic retinopathy is, is not the leading cause of blindness in working age population. That's a considerable achievement. So that's a really good positive statistic and yet we do still see a lot of people developing retinopathy and, and going blind from, from diabetes. So, so what are the, the problems that, that come with a screening programme? Why is it it's not a, even more successful than it is? Yeah, so, that, so our challenge is, firstly, are increasing prevalence. So in the UK, we have 2.5 million people with diabetes, and that's projected to double by, by 2030. Approximately 10% of them will have what's referred to as sight-threatening retinopathy. So uh, this is a challenge for resources, it's a challenge of scale to be able to screen that many people. The second uh, challenge we face is patients who are not engaged with services, and there's a whole variety of reasons for that. Treatment for diabetic retinopathy, the key is picking it up in most people before they develop symptoms. And so uh, re we rely on systematic screening, on a call recall system where patients are called in to have their photos. They may not know there's a problem, and um, if patients are not engaging with that, then uh, they're not going to be picked up early at a time when their disease can be, uh, be successfully treated. A third challenge we have is um, the uh, fragmentation of services. So um, an ideal everyone in the world wants to achieve for diabetes is a, is a one-stop shop, somewhere where patients can come and receive their medical care, but also receive screening and treatment for complications. And that's very difficult to, to provide in any environment, even a high resource environment. And um, in, certainly in the UK and in other parts of the world, fragmentation of services where, where clinicians um, are not able to talk to each other successfully. You know, we rely on a multidisciplinary approach. Those are the principal challenges yeah. for us. Okay, so you raise a couple of important points there. One is about the, the scale of, of screening. Um, and of course, at the moment, this relies on people and, and, and cameras and somebody reading the, the pictures, which is quite a complicated and, and time-consuming procedure. Absolutely. I, I mean, I've heard that there are now artificial intelligence systems that can actually read the photos for us. And, and are we going to just be handing all this over to uh, to computers in the next few years? Well, certainly involvement of AI is, def is definitely going to happen. That's definitely the, the future. So these systems rely on machine learning and deep learning algorithms to process uh, photographs of retinopathy and uh, d deliver a grade of retinopathy. And there's a huge potential cost-saving implication of, of introduction of those algorithms. There's a number of commercially available systems and other, others are in development and there's a uh, very important uh, technology assessment undertaken by Adnan Tufail and, and colleagues in 2016 at Moorfields um, that uh, showed that uh, some of these systems meet all the requirements of the uh, national diabetic eye screening program in the UK. There's widespread support for introduction of those systems uh, initially at the disease no disease boundary because 
we have to remember that 70% of people with diabetes, approximately, have no retinopathy. And just being able to have a machine tell us whether uh, make the difference between retinopathy and no retinopathy uh, can produce a huge cost saving. Scotland have gone some way to implementing those systems in, in their screening programme. Uh, the challenge now for us is to use these, uh, these developing systems, uh, improve their sensitivity and specificity, uh, use of real world data sets, um, increased use of uh, statistical methods to improve uh, the outputs from these systems, uh, but they're, they're definitely coming and will be implemented in the next few years. So you mentioned that 70% of people don't have retinopathy. Could we actually screen some of those people less often? At the moment, we're bringing them in every year, but if they're clear of retinopathy, the chance of them developing sight-threatening disease in, in a year is pretty low, isn't it? Ab absolutely. So there's a lot of observational data that suggests that some people in some people it's safe to increase that screening interval. Um, that, that is observational data and we haven't yet got randomised control trial data to show that. And the, the key is obviously identifying which people are, are suitable for increased screening lengths. And um, we have a lot of information on these patients demographic information, information on their systemic disease, and also in a screening programme we may have several years of uh, results from uh, retinopathy screening. What we hope to do, and this is being pioneered in Liverpool in the individualised screening for diabetic retinopathy study, that we, need to, we want to take all of that information and put that into a risk engine that can then produce individualised screening intervals. So yep, absolutely, there's, there's definitely potential for that, we're working on that, and that can definitely be del delivered. The reservations we have about that, and we have quite a lot of social science data on this where patients have been engaged to discuss their attitudes to risk perception and their attitudes uh, to disease management is that uh, we have concerns about compliance uh, and also the patient's understanding of the importance of screening if we tell people that they come back in two years, in three years, are they, are they less likely to comply with the test, are they less likely to um, then uh, consider retinopathy as an important complication. So, so we have reservations about that, but definitely that's a, a goal and, a, and could be particularly important in reducing the burden on patients and reducing the cost of the screening programme. Yeah. So, so in the UK, we've got a pretty well-developed system, but you mentioned that it's still, retinopathy is still a major cause of blindness in many other parts of the world, particularly developing world, where diabetes actually is, in many cases, even more common than it is in the UK. So what can we do in, in those more challenged environments to, to actually help reduce blindness from diabetes? Absolutely. So the challenge in, in a lot of parts of the world is, one, low resources, and two, scale, and I'll probably add a third thing, which is uh, geographical isolation. So those are a real challenge. Nobody has, a, has the definitive answer to this yet. What we need to do is take the lessons from Europe, that screening has to be systematic, that it has to be based on photography, allowing quality control, and also that's going to allow the um, introduction of these AI, artificial intelligence systems, as, as you said, and that take those lessons from Europe and try and apply them uh, in a way that works within the health environment in, in, in those particular countries. The, uh, we, th we think that it, it'll be important for screening in those environments to be point of care, so the patient uh, gets the result of the test at the time, and uh, this is because of the challenge of geographical isolation and the challenge of false positives, that sending a patient on a long journey to a, to a hospital which provides treatment infrastructure um, is, is a significant burden on that individual patient, so, uh, so we need to have a test which is highly sensitive but also highly highly specific that we can that we can target the right group of patients we think it is possible we're working um, with with ophthalmologists in low and middle income countries to uh, develop models of care and also to put in these new technologies new screening technologies so new portable cheap uh, cameras and imaging equipment uh, the AI systems which we discussed uh, which can bring down the cost um, massively of, of the system and also obviously th those screening systems rely on treatment infrastructure, uh, in increasing human resources, have the ophthalmologists who have subspecialty knowledge to deliver that. So, so it's a very big challenge mm. and nobody knows how to do it 
uh, definitively yet, but uh, but that's uh, that's something that's uh, that's in the minds of funders, uh, policy makers, and and of ophthalmologists. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, Philip. That okay. was a really interesting discussion. Thank you.